after those um, wonderful women. Um, so, uh, I'm 51, I have three sons. Um, I'm gonna be uh, the CEO of Ivano Cambridge in a few days. I'm a woman, I'm a mother, and I'm a professional in this order. That's my choice, uh, because I think that choice is not a man's privilege. And, uh, <laughs> and looking around, we see that there are different ways to succeed, and whatever success means, uh, that's very interesting to see the path and the careers that we have, uh, we have done, which, uh, which are very different. So uh, that would be my first lesson of this, uh, of this morning. I'm French. I moved to Montreal four years ago to join a wonderful company and a wonderful country uh, as a CFO of Ivano Cambridge, which is the subsidiary of the French-Canadian pension fund CDPQ. Uh, we deal with $65 billion, Canadian dollars, but even in Canadian <laughs> dollars, that's a big amount. <laughs> that's going to be around 50 US, uh, billion US dollars uh, in eight different worlds, so around the globe. Uh, that's a um, major responsibility, Matt. that's a major honor, which shows how audacious and bold uh, Canada could be to appoint a woman, a foreign woman. Um, I moved there with my whole family, so four years ago. Um, I have worked in, in fact, um, we have six companies on three continents. Uh, so I have tried to confront myself with different cultures. It has made me, I hope, a better leader, a better professional, and being able to question myself and to improve my style, my leadership of the different experience. Uh, that's definitely a great honor to be here today. Crew is less known in Europe as it is here in North America. And I hope that I'm going to be like, a, um, a, 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 I don't know, the relay between Europe and, and North America with crew and probably able to uh, increase their power in, uh, in Europe. So uh, that's why I'm very happy to be able here to celebrate not only this award today, but my appointment uh, as CEO. So it's like my first celebration with uh, uh, 1,200 people. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for that, and I'm sure I won't ever uh, forget this beautiful moment that we are going to spend together. Thank you. Wow, right? I know. <laughs> this is a big day for us. We have three really wonderful people, so I thought what we would do is I'll start off with some questions. Um, and you heard a nice uh, snippet, but there's a lot more underneath all of that I think we can dig into. So we'll start with a few questions and I'll let you know when it's your turn. So, <laughs> so first, um, this is a great question and I'll just, we're going to go down the road this way. This is for everyone. What would you say has been your greatest career success? When is that moment that you said, this is a great moment in my career? I think one of, I think that moment was experiencing the impact of the fiscal crisis on our business and being in a situation when times were difficult and we rose to the occasion and we dealt with it superbly well and we came out of it growing. Mm -hmm. And we kept innovating through the fiscal crisis. We kept finding opportunities and I think it was really the moment when all of the leadership skills and all of the creativity, all of the hard work really came to fruition because it's one thing to do well when times are good, but when you can find yourself getting out of bed in the morning excited to take on the struggle and the challenge and knowing that you're going to pull on everything inside of you and all of your resources and your great team and you pull through it well, that is a feeling of success. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Wonderful example. Uh, Leslie. 
Um, I think for us it was um, taking our company public um, and why that was so significant was because we recognized that um, all of the companies that looked like us, you know, a hotel company that primarily focused on limited service had actually been taken private. And so the ability to recognize a unique opportunity, a unique moment in time and capitalizing on that was a great accomplishment for us as a, as a, as a management team. Mm -hmm. Natalie? Um, I have always thought that my greater success was uh, the, the next one. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it's the way I'm looking forward and, and not really taking, uh, mm -hmm. taking everything that I've done like, okay, it's okay, it's done. So yeah. you can just go on. Uh, mm -hmm. Just thinking that okay, I have to be more focused, um, better and, uh, and yes, more uh, creative than ever for the next one. Always pushing forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, this one is for Leslie. Uh, you, when we've talked, you've called your career path the classic opportunistic path. Would you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Um, you know, for me, I think if you actually look at the ingredients of my career, it's pretty classic. I mean, I, um, I was willing to take on opportunities, I was willing to take risks, and I had mentors and sponsors. Mm -hmm. And all of those things, are like a lot of people have it, the opportunity mm -hmm. to experience, but the question is really, how did it all come together, and the ingredients, the, you know, the outcome was unique, and how I leverage each one of those components, but the ingredients, I believe, is, is pretty classic. Okay. Thank you. Um, Natalie, you have said that you were quite happy working in Paris with a great job, a cool husband, and happy kids. <laughs> what made you take the leap and make the move to Montreal for the position with uh, Ivano Cambridge? Um, definitely my boss. Uh -huh. Uh, I have been able, in fact, looking back at my career, to choose my bosses. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a great privilege, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and when Daniel Fournier, uh, who was uh, the head of Ivano Cambridge, came to see me in Paris four years ago, it was exactly March 15, we had a long dinner together, starting at 6, which is very early for French, I can tell you. <laughs> Lasting at midnight, and my husband was texting me, I thought that you were having a dinner with somebody that you don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we realized over the six hours we spent together that we shared a lot of things, especially values, which are, for me, the, the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then I thought that maybe I could be useful in this environment uh, because Daniel described me what he, did, he, he needed. And I thought that maybe that could be a good idea. So to be honest, that was the first thing. The second thing I, re I remember, I was in bed with my husband. <laughs> no, don't <laughs> uh. <laughs> And then I, I, I told him, okay, um, I know what I can do. I know that I'm gonna be yes. Um, useful in this experience, but that's going to be a family adventure, not only uh, my adventure, so what do you think about it? And he said immediately, um, no, let's do it. Uh, it would have been the same in the opposite side. If he, he would have been, if he would have had this kind of opportunity, we would have had the same conversation. And he said, okay, let's do it. That's going to be good, obviously, for you, but that's going to be good also for the whole family to try to do something different and especially to like open the minds of our children. And after four years, I can tell you that it was uh, probably one of our best uh, yeah. decisions. Yeah, I probably guess your probably. children are global citizens. They've been raised in a number of countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's nice. interesting. So Anne-Marie, when the CEO role came open at TREP, what made you throw your hat in the ring? What was it? Well, it's interesting, um, in 2004, uh, by that point, the original founder of, of TREP had added two investors to the company over the years, and those investors uh, and, and the founder um, were, uh, the door, there was a knock on the door, and a British media company, uh, the Daily Mail and General Trust, was interested in purchasing the company. And the three owners of the company um, decided to sell it, and um, that created a vacancy in the CEO slot. And DMGT, who is still our parent to this day, DMGT at that time announced an internal search and an external search. So um, I decided that after 15 years at that point of being in-house counsel in what had been a small but growing company, um, when you're in a small company, your talents get utilized everywhere. And I really knew 
how the company operated, mm -hmm. and I knew so much about it that I felt I had qualifications for the role. Um, but th I was also aware I was the only woman applying, there were other men internally applying, and there were men externally applying. And on the whole, all of those other applicants were either extremely steeped in bond finance or extremely steeped in computer science and technology. And I was an English literature major <laughs> who went to law school. So I said, all right, I am a qualified candidate. My plan A was to go for the role. My plan B was that if I did not get the role, at the very least, I had put my best foot forward and the new owners of the company would have gotten to know me better as a result of this whole interview process. Mm -hmm. And I was hope, hopeful that they would then consider me for another leadership role. Mm -hmm. um, and my plan A worked, yeah. so I got plan A. <laughs> <laughs> great strategy, though. Yeah. You, know, you knew where you were going to do one or the other. That's well, great. Always That's have great. a plan B. Yeah. <laughs> always have a plan B. Right. So I'm going to say to the audience now, we have about 12 minutes, 13 minutes left. So if you have a question, start making way to the, to the uh, microphone here up front if you'd like to ask a question. While you're doing that, I'm going to ask Natalie. Um, I, some of you know I've been practicing my French the last couple of weeks trying to prepare for a question in French for Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> and so we practiced together this morning. So I'm going to ask, what is your arm secret? What is your okay. arm secret? <laughs> <laughs> At least a part of the, of the room I understand it? the question. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be like my secret weapon? In business, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's funny that you, you, you add in business, because I would say that um, I'm always the same. So I, I'm not somebody in business or somebody in my personal life. Once more, it's my choice, and I don't think that it's a role model, but just, it has been my choice to, to be always the same um, woman, uh, the same uh, person. Uh, I think I'm very genuine, and I, mm. I, I think that uh, what you see is what you get, uh, and sometimes you get also my flows, and, uh, um, but that, that's okay with me. Uh, I'm very emotional, so everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, I'm very intense, uh, but at least what I think has helped me, especially with different cultures, different types of companies, is that at least um, they know exactly who I am, and then, of course, I'm going to try to adjust and learn from what I see around, but that's going to be me, whatever happens. So, and one of my coach, because I have had some coaches, you, you mm -hmm. call that uh, in English, um, said to me one day, uh, you shouldn't dilute yourself. Mm -hmm. So you, you should be you, because if, if you um, give up on that, then it's not going to be fun for a long time. So at, at, a, at a point, you are going to just give up completely. Mm -hmm. So I thought that, OK, I have to live with what, who I am. And, um, and yes, that's yeah. going to be the way I'm, I think um, people see me as the being genuine. It's beautiful. Thank you. Let's go to the microphone. Hi, Sarah Ellis, Crew Atlanta. So you guys talked about sponsors and um, mentors and things like that. What specific qualities um, were important in those people that were mentoring you and sponsoring you? Because we have this whole mentor protege crew program, and I'm doing it for the first time this year. And I just want to make sure that I'm giving my mentee what she needs. Well, go ahead, Emery. When I think of the, the people who've mentored me, I think the most valuable thing a mentor can do is give direct, clear feedback and give feedback that, re, re, uh, that references a specific example. You know, I've had mentors in my, in my career who have sometimes after a meeting taken me aside quietly, privately, this was when I was more junior, and, and said, oh, in that meeting, these are the things you did very well. And here are some things you can do better the next time. That's great. It was clear. It was direct. Mm -hmm. It was expected. And it also was specific. Mm -hmm. So I think those are qualities that are very helpful. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I, I would say for me that um, <clears throat> the best mentor-mentee uh, relationships are the ones that are organic. 
um, because you really have to be able to relate to the person in mul on a multiple mm -hmm. of levels. My mentor who changed my life was somebody who changed not the way, changed not only the way that I saw the world, but so, changed the way that I saw myself in the world. And simply just asked me a very basic question, mm -hmm. which was, you know, what are your peers doing? Mm -hmm. And I proceeded to answer that question as, you, as anybody would say, well, my peers are doing this, my peers are doing that, mm -hmm. my classmates, and then he cut me off and redefined what my peers were and just mm -hmm. said that my peers aren't the people who are went to college with or went, you know, worked with, my peers are the people who are doing what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so that type of mm -hmm. ability to relate to somebody um, is a unique component. And so I think it's organic, you know, relationships. Thing. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's a really good perspective. Hi, Leslie Teske with Indie Crew. Um, first off, you ladies have been phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, all of you are wildly successful, as we can all see. And I think for many of us in the room, it's easy to assume that you've never had setbacks or failures. Mm. So what I would love to hear are examples <laughs> of a failure that you've had, um, personally or professionally, and how you either overcame it or just moved past it. Thank you. Good question. Who wants to start that? I said I, I, that I came with my flows and everything, so <laughs> no problem. Um, firstly, and, and it's really not like something that you're too academic or anything like that, you learn a lot from, uh, from what you have failed, mm -hmm. so, uh, and probably more than what you, uh, uh, you have succeeded finally. And it's really something that's, that's sticking to your mind, but it shouldn't be like in a in a bitter way or negative way. It should be like, okay, it, it, does, it didn't work, and you should be able, and that's why I think we are resilient, and especially as women, we are able to do that, especially because resiliency should be like maybe our main strength mm -hmm. on the long term. Right. So being able to say, okay, I'm looking in the mirror, I'm looking at that, and being able to say, that's unpleasant, and we talked about it <laughs> this morning with my, one of my, uh, uh, of, of my uh, fellow at, at the table. We have to, a failure, it's, most of the time it's unpleasant, but it's not dangerous. And we have to distinguish mm -hmm. what is unpleasant and what is dangerous. And if you look at everything like that, then you can go on because you can say, okay, that was not really good. I could have done better or maybe the circumstances could have been different. Next time I'm gonna do better probably, but at least I'm not dead, but my <laughs> children are okay. Right. So I enough. think it's a good way to keep the distance yeah. and, and to true. really like uh, really realize true. that you can go through all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, nevertheless, and I could, have, I could be, be able to quote different uh, technical things that I've missed, but personally, my, my, my most, and, and still the case today, the most difficult thing for me is when you do not succeed in management, when you're not able to extract the value, the resources of your team. And, and sometimes, and I'm thinking of, about somebody, he doesn't know, but, uh, <laughs> or maybe he knows, but today he's not around. <laughs> um, you know, you, you're, you're trying hard, and you try to explain, and you try different styles, and at the end, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So for me, at the end, and that's why I really think that it's always a question of people, because you can be very skilled, you can have a lot of, uh, uh, yes, um, uh, you can be very smart, very, sm very bright, but you are, going not, you are not going to be able to do it by yourself. You're gonna need people, you're gonna need a team to do it. So if you're not able to have this team behind you, whatever happens, then it could lead you to something more dangerous than only unpleasant. So that's why, for me, it's still a question that I've not been able to uh, really uh, solve. Okay, good. good. Uh, Leslie, do you want to Yeah, I mean, I think we, we often get, as leaders, get asked a question like, tell me about a failure and that, you would, um, that you've had, or tell me something that you'd want to do over. And for me, I wouldn't want to do anything over. Um, my um, failures have been my greatest learning. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, uh, I love the question in terms of what was your secret weapon. For me, I think it's being a woman. Mm. Because I think that we have intuition. It's not secret. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not anymore. <laughs> it's secret from the men because they don't get it. <laughs> 
but you know, it, it's a, we have we have unique ability to be compassionate, our ability to have intuition, our ability to understand what somebody else's needs are when they don't even understand it. Um, and so it's also we have the ability to be self-critiquing of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I have a failure, I spend an incredible amount of time understanding mm -hmm. right. what I did wrong and how I could have done differently. But once I get that lesson, I move on. I don't hang on to the failure um, because it will weigh you down. Mm -hmm. But I do hang on to the lesson. And as long as I learn something from the failure, then it was a great failure. No. It was a great learning lesson from that Absolutely. perspective. And so yeah. that's the way I think about yeah. it. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Come on up. Don't be shy. Hi, Marie. Hi. Marie McLucas, Cruz Sharp. Thank you for your authenticity and stories. Uh, my question is specifically for Anne Marie, but I would like uh, all of your answers too. Uh, you said always have a plan B which I've always subscribed to that philosophy too, but recently a mentor of mine said never have a plan B because if you only have a plan A, you'll pursue it with vigorance. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on her uh, advice to me on don't have a plan B. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's a great question. I, I think that you have a plan A and you go for it with everything you've got, absolutely. But sometimes things happen in life that are not your fault, but they're your problem. And you just may need to know that you have other options. So when I started at TREP in 1990, and I thought I was going to be there for a couple of years during the recession, um, and then I loved being on the inside of a business so much, I realized I had this entrepreneurial spirit, and I was thoroughly committed to making TREP greater every year, I also said to myself, I couldn't forget the fact that my law firm was a victim of the recession. Nothing's a guarantee. As great as this company is, as great as the industry seemed to be and growing, something could happen. And so my plan B was to always make sure that I knew where my other options could lie. Um, and what I did, my main plan B, was networking and mm. creating a massive network. And the interesting, interesting thing about that plan B was that if something had happened, and if I had not stayed at TREP, and if I had left it involuntarily for any reason, I had this enormous network of people I knew and a lot of roles in companies that I really felt I could fill. But because nothing happened negatively with TREP, and it just has been a marvelous career there, the networking that I was doing also helped my business at TREP. So I think you can have a plan A and be focused on it and also have other things working as well that can support your plan A or can be your necessary go-to if life changes on you. Okay, thank you. Um, Adrian. Hi, Adrian Bain, Crew Charlotte, and Crew St. Louis. Do you know everybody by name? In the maybe, <laughs> maybe. We'll, we'll test that out. <laughs> impressive. It's yeah. very impressive. <laughs> Thank you all for your time today. You know, as women, I think we look at our gender as being a disadvantage. Um, so I'd like for each of you to address um, where being female has been an advantage, and specifically for Ms. Hale, where being a double minority has either been a detriment or benefit in your career progression. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Sure. Um, I, I would I, I would say that um, I'll ask I'll answer the latter part first. Um, the the beautiful thing about being an African American woman is that there aren't that many of me, so people always know who I am. <laughs> um, and so I I, I, I leverage I leverage that. Um, they often know me. I can't remember their name though. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I would say like that, you, you know, um, in terms of being a woman, uh, building off of Anne Marie's comments, I have built an incredible network of mentors and sponsors. And I think that my ability to endear myself to my mentors um, has uh, allowed them to invest in me at a level that I, they probably don't invest in others. And again, it goes back to those innate experiences that we have as a mother, as we have as women in our relationships. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I, as I talked about in, in my prepared remarks, the vast majority of the people in my network who supported me were all men in the first part of my career. Right. But I was non-threatening, you know, to, in, the, in that element of my career. 
I could approach them in a way, um, and again, endear myself to them, both from a standpoint of wanting to learn and grow, but also from a, an innate relationship is what I sort of talked about before. So I think a lot of the things that we have as women that are natural to us are the things that I leveraged in, in terms of, of being a woman. Mm -hmm. and, um, and while I joke about um, the elements of being an African-American woman, I actually am very serious about the component of um, allowing people to, to recognize who I, who I am as, as a result of that. Natalie, do you yes. have? I just want to, to add, in my own experience, to be honest, I, I've never really seen myself as a woman. <laughs> it's just the beginning of the whole... Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's just because I've been through different things that was obvious that I was, most of the time, the only woman around the table, but it yeah. was not really a problem for me. Right. And that has been my way to go through all those things without questioning every time why am I alone? Uh, is it my place? I've always thought that, that I was at the right place at the right time. So it has been my way. Once more, everybody can choose hers, but um, there, sorry. But, uh, you know, it's important also to know that we, we can define, you know, I define myself as being Natalie. But I did chef. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't define myself as, as being a woman. Mm -hmm. Obviously, what I know now, having said that, is that it's not easy. I, I can't tell you the, the, the opposite. It's not easy to be a woman in real estate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is an association in France which calls 17% one seven because in the biggest event of uh, real estate in Cannes, which uh, stands uh, in, in, yes, at the South of France, so very... Uh, very welcoming. So usually there, there are like 30,000 people. And last year, there were only 17% of women. Can you imagine that? So that's, that means that the job is not done. Yeah. So yeah. that's why mm -hmm. I've been through that right. until recently. And now I know that I can't just not tell to myself I'm a woman. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. I know that it comes with yeah. more responsibility than, than being just myself. Right. Yeah. Just to bring this full circle, actually, in my experience and in answer to that question, elements of both what Natalie and Leslie said I, I, I resonate with me. I really never thought about the fact that I was female. But I think in the course of my career, and especially in leading people, natural uh, inclinations of being female. I, too, am married a very long time. I have two grown sons natural, uh, intuitive, instinctual behaviors of females came through in my leadership style. And many of my employees have given me feedback about how much they find me sincere, authentic, and trustworthy. And I think those are the elements of my femininity that come through my leadership. So I, I think that's my answer to your question. Okay, Bonnie. Money. <laughs> <laughs> it's a setup. <laughs> uh, well They're all actors. <laughs> <laughs> I am Bonnie Gottlieb, uh, Crew DC, uh, and Leslie Hale is a member of uh, Oh, Beach. yeah. Uh, we all talk about diversity and inclusion. I'd be very interested to hear what you're doing in your companies to further that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start? Okay. Yes. yes, please. We have a very, very diverse employee base at TREP. Uh, we have um, large numbers of women in leadership positions in the company. I have a lot of women in tech in the company. Uh, my head of marketing is female. My, my chief marketing officer is female. My chief people officer is female. My director of facility management is female. My entire contracts team is female. Um, we have many women. and. Um, we just promoted three women to senior vice president in our bond finance team. So in, in addition, we have um, many employees of color. We have many employees that we have sponsored for citizenship. Um, so um, we, the, the most interesting thing about the diversity at my company is that someone recently, I think it was my, my chief people officer who heads all of our HR efforts, recently quoted me statistics about men and women about minorities, et cetera. And I didn't even know the numbers because we were picking people for their talent and we never saw them um, in, 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 in terms of gender or race or 
uh, country of origin. Um, so I, I think that when you are truly focusing on people for skills and talent, and you pick the best people that come forward, um, you, you can find that you have a marvelously in, in inclusive company. Um, and so that's been our history. Um, I, I would say um, the same thing for RLJ, extremely diverse organization, um, more than 50% of our organization is diverse, both women and minorities. Mm -hmm. um, we have diversity at every level, um, half of our board is diverse from women and minorities as well, and they hold me accountable for making sure that I still have that throughout the organization. But the one thing that I would say that I do and that I would encourage all of us to do when we're in leadership positions is, is that I am not afraid to call somebody on something that I think is... Um, you know, when, that, when we have people who have blind spots, so do will. So, you know, yeah. for example, in a recent, you know, um, we did a talent review. We went through a room on every, every employee in the whole entire company. And I had, you know, an executive who, are, who described an African-American woman as articulate. Yeah. Now, she, he didn't describe all of the other people before him as mm. articulate. Um, and so, you know, pulled him to his side and explained to him that articulate and how it, what it means and, and for people of color means that you're, you are comparing me to everyone else, that they are, are I'm articulate, uniquely articulate relative to everyone else. And so those nuances, I'm very quick to sort of point those out so that we can sort of take off the blinders for people. For um, and I also make sure that people are given a fair shot. Um, and so I have the ability to do that because I'm at the table and I can see that you're working this person, this woman, oftentimes, you're more than happy to have her do all of your administrative work, all your project manager and carry your bags. But when it comes time for to make the promotion, somehow you think the other men aren't gonna be receptive to her. Mm -hmm. And that's unacceptable to me. And I make that clear. Um, and so I use the position to not necessarily, um, you know, push people who don't deserve to be there, but to make sure that everybody gets a fair shot. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I've still a lot of, of um, potential within my company. There, there are definitely women in different areas, but more in the uh, corporate functions than uh, investment and transactional um, teams are still very male. Uh, and it's, it's an area, because to be honest, within uh, commercial real estate, uh, most of the time, and that's probably true also for your own companies, we have a lot of women in HR, a lot of women mm -hmm. uh, in accounting, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. a lot of women in uh, communication, those mm -hmm. kind of areas, but when it comes to uh, the, um, like, like the core of the company, uh, it's still very, very uh, a, a man's uh, territory. So um, looking at, uh, for example, my, my investment team, I would have um, 10 different leaders around the world and I, I only have one woman. So I can tell you that uh, that's gonna be uh, definitely on, on the top of my list for the next years. Yeah. We so, only, sorry, that's, uh, no. Yeah. no, that's okay. <laughs> that's a great answer. We have time for one more question if you want to step forward. Oh, you win, Natalie. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know her it's name. It's going to be a yeah. French question. Oh. Good, <laughs> yes. Just between now. Uh, <laughs> Bethany from Crew Montreal. Thank you, Natalie, for accepting the speaking engagement this morning. Um, as women, a lot of us have a, a harder time to accept speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of uh, news shows and things like that having a hard time to recruit a 50 50 diversity. Uh, Mm -hmm. or women accepting the speaking engagement. So when was the first time you accepted a speaking engagement and how did you push your team also to accept those speaking engagements? Because it's important to have a diversity. Okay, let me think back. Think first back, time. when was the first time? <laughs> right. I, I, I talk too much, I've always talked too much. So no, uh, no, 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 uh, <laughs> Do you have something to say? Yeah. Do you, Leslie? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, oh, just a just few Go words. On. Just, it, it's, um, you know, the young people especially, they believe what they see, what they can touch. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's, uh, if, if we are not like somewhere in their pictures, then they just don't believe mm -hmm. that it, it's happening. So mm -hmm. that's why I think we should be more present, especially on TV, uh, on uh, social uh, medias and so on, because it's like there's, it's structural. 
if they think about finance and they see only we, uh, men talking about uh, economics and uh, all those things, and they're going to think that, okay, it's a male territory. And if, if uh, the, the only women who are on TV talk about beauty and, uh, and clothes and so on, okay, they're going to say, okay, that's the uh, women's thing. So we have to promote ourselves by being uh, visible. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not the case, then it's not going to structure the minds of the, of the new generation. Right.